Oh, uh, hello, uh, Dugan Bad Warrior, uh, Zoo Yoshita Ranch here on the Shine River Zoo Reservation. Um, when did I need to know I had a problem and needed a drought plan? I think it was in 2017 when we was kind of going through a dry spell. And I was in an executive link meeting in Montana. And one of the people running that there had a drought plan and shared it with us. And it just made so much sense. So I went and developed my own when I got home. Um, incorporated it into, I was still leasing some cows out at that time. Incorporated it into my contracts with people I was leasing with. And then when I started filling all my land up with my own cattle, I had created a ABC herd within that. So I know what, what, class was going to go when I didn't meet my trigger points, my trigger dates. So, um, it was 2017 when I knew I needed that, that drought plan. And last year, I was the first time I really had to use it. I was down in number of cows. I wasn't, so I had some room to lease out some cows. And I, I told the guy, a young guy that I'd lease his cows out. And of course I had my drought plan in the contract. And all the trigger points, we couldn't hit the, the rainfall. And I, every time I had a trigger point, I says, well, you're going to have to leave half your herd or uh, whatever the, the drought plan said. I think it was a quarter, then it went to half, then it went to all of them. He didn't quite understand because he seen I had the grass, but that's not the point. You know, I, I just couldn't abuse my ground and we didn't have any water, so... Last year was the first year I ever had to use my drought plan and I was thankful for it. And I can show right now that my grass is pretty good in this drought, but it would have been terribly worse if I'd have brought all them cows in. So, um, those, so that was when I knew I needed a drought plan. I wish I had it years before when we went through droughts, but I'm glad I have it now. Um, how does the Zuyo Shicha Ranch rank its resources? Um, I think I'm in a little different position than most ranches. Uh, I'm not most, but I, I have a, a, a tribal lease with the Shiner Vasu tribe that is, uh, you know, the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is, is kind of sets my stocking rate, but I kind of maneuver my um, holistic resource, uh, management within that and, and uh, still achieve what I want to do and not um, be in violation of BI rules, which in my opinion are very antiquated and need to be changed. And if they could see what I'm doing, it would. But uh, how do I rank resources? I think number one is family. I have found that out in the last few years. Family is your number one resource. You know, if you don't have your family, if you don't have the backing of anything on that, then you're, you're doomed to fail. Um, land is number two and grass, and grass management's number three. Um, your cattle, livestock, either be your cows or your horses, would be the next, because those are your tools to manage your grass to the way you want to do it. Um, you know, your your equipment, and everything else is is last, in my opinion. You know, those are just you know indispensable. I mean, they're they're very easily you know can leave the ranch. But your cattle is what's going to make you a good manager of your land. So those are the how I rank the resources on, on the Zuyo Shicha Ranch, uh, with family being number one. And I've changed my ranch in the last few years to make it more accommodating so my girls will want to continue on what I'm doing. Dugan, how important is planning your annual grazing rotation and maybe when do you do that? Well, I started in the last couple of years. Um, I want my grazing plan done by January 1. That way I kind of have a plan for the year. Um, have I ever followed through with that? No, I've had to change it throughout, but I have a plan. I kind of know where I want to go and it just deviates, you know, uh, depending on, on the weather. But 
January 1, I usually, and I wish I had it here, but it's so big, I got, I got a, a grazing chart and a map. Then I, and I lay out my, my paddocks that I want. And so by January 1, I want that map done and my grazing plan as much filled out as possible because then it just relieves so much stress because I can put on there, this is when I typically brand and I can have it on my map. You know, this is the dates that my daughter's high school rodeo and I'm going to be, you know, branding, uh, calving. I have all them on my chart, you know, or if I got a big uh, South Dakota grasslands grazing school I'm going to go to, I can put that down there. So I know all these things ahead of time that when I reach this point, I'm like, I'm going to be at the grazing school for four or five days. I need to change the, the plan. I need to make my pasture a little bigger than, than what I had planned for this, this time. So having a plan by January 1 is very important for me. It, it, it's something you just have to do. You have to do it. And it, it just relieves so much stress when you know where you're going. You know, because a lot of guys don't know where they're going at this time of year. Well, I think I have grass in this pasture. And each year I don't, I try not to start in the same place. I try to start in a different pasture. Um, it might be one pasture over, or it might be five pastures over. The last two years, it's, it's always been one or two pastures over, but I never try to start in the same spot just, just to, Give, give the grass a different, hitting at different times because, you know, now I'm trying to, trying to incorporate, trying to get rid of some of my cool season grasses that I don't want. So that's going to be implemented from here on out. I'm going to try to do that because I'm, through this drought, I've learned to adapt and, and my herd's going to change so I can be real adaptive with this new herd where I want them to start and knowing where my my Kentucky bluegrasses are, are my, my rome or whatever it is, I can hit that harder in the spring. So that's going to really help me knowing from here on out. And then so having a plan by January 1 is, is very, very important. So Dugan, you mentioned A, B, and C or 1, 2, and 3. You could put any, any moniker on it you yep. want, but, but really going through your herd and, and separating them by you know a herd is the very last to go yeah you know those are those are the genetic ones that you've really worked hard to keep or build um you know bees close maybe they're the 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 younger cows that are coming up but haven't proven themselves um yeah how how should a guy start if he's never done something like that first off is creating that class i think creating creating your different classes of, of your animals and even then that's, that's even hard for guys to do because they're going to, everybody's in love with their animals. You know, everybody's, and it took me a long time to build this herd. And yeah, I know, and I understand that. And I, I was that way too, man. I'm just, man, I can't get rid of these cows. They're so good. They're, but the deal is, is create that class. Here's, here's my best cows. Okay. Here's my next set of best cows. And here's, here's my other ones that this fall I was probably going to get rid of anyways, you know, that I, you know, cause so make room for these younger ones. So if you do that and you have these classes, then you can feel a little more comfortable and say, all right, well, class C, yeah, they're great, but yeah, they got to go because I, I, just, I just can't feed them. I can't afford to feed them. You know, um, I was going to get rid of them anyways, or, or they're going to eventually go down the road anyways. They're just going to have to maybe do it a year or two sooner. So I think that's something that they need to do. And it's hard. It's going to be hard for a lot of guys because they fall in love with their animals. And a lot of people have great herds. Don't get me wrong. But the deal is, is, is the one big thing that I learned is, is you got to have a profit. Your ranch has got to be profitable. And you can't be a hobby farmer. It can't be anything else. Because if you don't look at being profitable first, you're never, you're never going to get there. You're just always going to be struggling. And, and through a drought, it's going to show. So... That's the thing is everybody's got to look at it. All right, if I got rid of these animals, yeah, it's not going to hit me hit me that hard. I still make my profits with these other animals. And then it might open your eyes up to new avenues. If I get rid of sea herd and I found out, hey, I made a little money off of sea herd. Well, next year I'm not going to buy such. Maybe I buy another sea herd and make money on that again because they're going to be a lower 
devalued animal where I don't got to buy back the most expensive. I don't got to buy back $2,000 heifer or young cow or I can go buy a devalued animal, run her for the summer, get rid of both of them and make, make a profit. So it might, it might open guys' eyes up to there's other opportunities out there than just to be cow-calf or whatever you are. So there, it might open your eyes up to a new opportunity for the ranch that's going to make you some money. And that way, it'll allow you resilience in, within your herd. You're not in love with these animals anyways. They're just kind of a disposable herd anyway. So if we run into another drought, that's your first animal to go. And so then, then it can ease your mind a lot easier. So I think, I think the deal is, is you just got to, you got to create within your herd, you got to have A, B, and C herd and C is, or whatever it is, one, two, or three, and three is your disposable one. And you just got to get comfortable with that. And again, ranching of profit has just drilled it into me. Run your numbers, know your numbers, know what you need to do. And it'll make you a lot more comfortable. You said something really important, or we're, or we're talking around the topic, is that we live this agricultural lifestyle. We, we live where we work, but it's still a business. And, yep. and sometimes that gets lost on us because we're in it 24-7, 365. And, uh, and so it's, it's good to hear that approach. Yep. For you, what's the lasting value of, of having this grazing and drought plan? What's the lasting value of having this grazing and drought plan? The lasting value is, is that I know that my, my pastures are going to be healthy and uh, productive for years to come. Um, so having this grazing plan, drought plan, I know that I am not going to be hurting my, my pastures with it, that I'm going to be benefiting them. And, you know, uh, a guy once told me, and I met him, and he, I, we was talking cows, and he said, I don't see myself as a, as a cow man anymore. I see myself as a grass farmer. And that really stuck to me. And having these plans, I want to be the best grass farmer I can be. And how I'm going to uh, harvest that is through an animal. And so that really stuck with me. And having these plans in place is only going to benefit that. You know, having plans, having these drought plans, grazing plans, knowing your, your tonnage per acre can benefit you years on down the line. If you want to, if you get your pastures to where your current herd ain't, you can diversify and do other things with it. And that's where I'm hoping to get my pastures is, man, here's something else I can do because my grass and my pastures are so much better. So that is something that I think is just going to be a big benefit to this ranch down the road. So I'm hearing a long, long-term commitment from you to continue managing in this way because just like degrading land takes time healing it does too right? yes yeah. yeah this is this is i'm just in the infancy stage of this and, and i know just visiting with guys who've done it for 20 30 years they're still feel like they're in the infancy phase because they're seeing so many more benefits year after year you know i want to see this for my girls when they take it over that they just continue on with it and see even more benefit you know so um i just think Managing your grass properly is, is something that's going to just make your ranch, it, it can make you or break you, you know, so I don't want it to break me. I want it to make, make my ranch. So well, after ranching for profit, I um, got the tools that they sent me home with to run my numbers and to, to get my projections done. And before I went there, when I would go to the sale barn, I was always hoping and nervous and hoping for a good day, you know, nervous I was going to make my payments. After I went to Ranch for Profit and I had my projections done, that relieved a lot of stress on me because I kind of knew where I needed to be, what my numbers were, and running my numbers. So when I sat in the sale barn that fall, I was never so relaxed in my life. 
sitting in there. Kind of knew where I had to be. If they wasn't there, I kind of knew my projections. I knew what I, what everything I needed to do. And so that was a very, very relaxful situation. That was probably the most relaxed I've ever been. Um, and the other thing it taught me was to, to do a profit target. And so what a profit target is, after you have all your obligations met and paying yourself, what do you, what kind of profit do, do I want or the family want and what do we want to do with it? So if it's a hundred thousand, if it's 50,000, so that's, that's the, our profit target. And my profit target recently changed because I had a living situation change, but it's changed through every year. My profit target doesn't stay the same every year. Some years it's a little higher, some years it's a little lower. Have I met it yet? No, I haven't. I'm still in that process of trying to trying to get there. But I think through the drought, the biggest thing ranchers need to do is they need to run their numbers on their cattle and know what, know how they're going to manage through this and just be able to meet your obligations. Uh, you might not have a profit. I know I don't have very much of a profit target schedule for this year because of the drought. So running your numbers, being comfortable, and knowing that you can make your obligations, be able to meet family living, and doing all that. So that's going to probably help a lot of ranchers when they going through this drought and running your numbers, running scenarios. That was the one thing is when I got to tools from Ranching for Profit, it was almost intoxicating because when I came home, I would I was just running numbers and running scenarios and what can I do this? Can I do this? Wow, you know, and and so then I got a lot more comfortable and now that also really opened my eyes to, man, I can do this and change my operation this way and I can do this and not just be a conventional rancher or, you know, just cow-calf. What if I went and diversified and into, you know, a short-term position with short-term cattle? Will I make more money that way? random numbers and it seems like that's a really good opportunity so those are some of the things we can do and i think with this drought that really gives ranchers if they can run their numbers and they don't even have to be through ranching for profit it just run your numbers know your numbers know what you got to meet to make it and like you said if you create an a b and c herd if i get rid of c i know i can still make my obligations to the bank make a living and then that's enough this year. Uh, if I get rid of C and D herd because I just don't have enough grass and water, this is what it's gonna do. And then you know, well, maybe I gotta, maybe I gotta do something a little different to, to get that extra income. But running your numbers is gonna be very helpful and it might relieve a lot of stress. There was a guy in my EL group and he got out and he, I don't think he'll mind me saying it, but JD Stendlin out of Wolf Point, he says, facts are a great currency for buy-in. And when you run your numbers, and those are facts, those are, be honest with your numbers. Don't lie about your numbers. You got to be honest. Those are a great currency for everybody who's part of the ranch to buy into the change we got to make. So JD had a great saying there, and I, I live by that. That's a great saying. So uh, I'm part of... Uh, I went to school in Rancho for Profit in 2016, and after that, um, Dave Pratt, the owner at that time, asked me, and, and um, Alan Crockett had asked me to uh, be part of Executive Link. It's the next step after you take the school, and you're part of a, a board of ranchers that dive into each other's ranch and, and look for look for issues that can be fixable or or however, and and help you with your problems you're having. Um, I think that has changed my ranch from the time I took that to today. My ranch ain't the same. It doesn't even look even similar to when I first went in 2016 to what it is now, to all the things I was, I was uh, doing and doing wrong. Um, I went from a mindset of I can't do that to how can I do that? And it was... That was the biggest uh, paradigm shift for me was, you know, just just being a, a mindset of how can I do that? Just like the drought plan. 
oh, I can't do that because of this. No, how can I do that? I need to do that. So how can I develop the drought plan? How can I do ABC herd? How can I do any of this? And it's, I've went through a lot of ups and downs in the, through the years and, and my board, my executive link board has really helped me through the process of, of not failing, you know, so the ranching for profit executive link is a huge benefit to my ranch and it's changed it immensely. So. So what benefits are you seeing in your pastures from this extended rest? I mean, you're, you're towing the line of, of at least a year yep. before you return with livestock. Yep. Since I started this, um, I've noticed that when I started it, just that recovery time in, in a pasture that I normally used to custom graze and abuse, giving it that rest, I started to see some of the ketone species I always wanted, the, the big blue stem. I, not so much uh, buffalo grass taking over, but even some western wheat coming back into the hard pan areas that were being abused. So giving it that rest and that recovery has allowed a lot more of my native species to take over that were there, but were just being hammered and hit and abused every year, year after year. And giving it that amount of time to recover, I see the species I want back in my pastures. They were always there. They were just getting abused every year, never given a chance to, to see what they can do. Um, the litter, having a lot more litter, and that's even beneficial in some of the hard pans areas that I have, just having a litter and, and some of the areas I don't hit so hard anymore and being able to cover some of that hard pan up and give it some of the, the nutrients it needs to, to change from hard pan to, to productive pasture. And this, this is a part of your grazing plan, even amidst drought. You might have to adjust, of course, but, but you're still aiming for that long recovery, even even in the midst of half production or third production that you might normally see. Yeah, and in the drought, you know, I, I normally aim for that 355 to 360 days, and I might I might even extend it, you know, depending on the drought. Can you know, I'm, I'm even thinking of extending them days in this drought just to give it that extra recovery time because, you know, even just giving it that rest, if we don't get any any moisture given it that same amount of rest, we might not have the recovery that we need. You know, it's great that it's resting, but the recovery is not probably gonna happen. So I might even extend that out further, hoping like we all ranchers do is hope that we get the moisture to get that recovery we need. And the mechanism to achieve that in a pretty severe drought situation is that you, you're, you're dealing with fewer livestock, right? Yes. So you're able to still move across the ranch and probably in smaller, maybe even more numerous paddocks in order to extend that rest period. Yeah, because I've I've really drastically cut my herd this last couple of years because last year was the drought and I kind of knew it. And then even this year, I didn't uh, retain any heifers. I didn't do any of that. Um, so my herd's a lot smaller and I'm going to move a lot faster. And that's implemented in my grazing plan. I just, it, my, my, map looks really crazy because there's a lot more little paddocks in there and the only th caveat to that is is water and and i'm having some issues with water because some of my pastures i'm still only able to do with stock dams but i just recently purchased a pump that i can pump out of the dams that can keep me from going in there but i can still pump away from the dam to some paddocks that that'll help um so that's that's the only thing is with the caveat with all these little pastures is making sure you have adequate water to do that. How valuable are your personal and business relationships in a time like this when when stress is high because there's so much uncertainty uh, with is it going to rain? My say that again. How valuable are personal and business relationships in a time like this? Oh, they're, they're extremely important. You, you know, in a stressful time like this, you need your people around you for support and your mental health is going to be challenged and things like this. So 
I think your family and your friends and, you know, even coworkers and, and agencies, you know, the NRCS, just whoever is going to help support you on what you want to do is important. Your business, very important. Your bankers probably got to be abreast of everything you're going to be doing. And I would do that through your numbers and let your banker know, you know, these are some of the changes that are going to be coming. Um, and so your businesses, even who you deal with in your feed, let them know that, man, I might not be buying as much, you know, tubs or whatever you're buying this year because I'm going to be, my cash position ain't going to be as great through this drought. So being in touch with all the biz people you do business with is, is very important, I think. So, but uh, yeah, I think uh, it is something you need to do so you don't get so bogged down and stressed out reach out to everybody that's going to be doing business with your ranch so that when the time comes and it's not in april and you're going to your banker god i can't you know something's gotta something's gotta happen you know you're not you're not surprising him and so those those things are are really important through any kind of disaster you're going through you know Some ranches will use drought to enhance their ability to weather the next one by making investments in water. What role do water developments play on this ranch? Water development has, in the last few years, has kind of been one of my number one priorities. And it's not because of drought. It's because it, it's going to allow me to hit all my goals I want with regenerative ag and let me be a lot more... Uh, diverse a lot more um, it's not going to restrict me on how I do my regenerative practices so um, I was just in with Dave Ziska at, at the NRCS in, in Zeebot County and that's one thing we're gonna we're gonna really implement this year is is the one big issue with me is I got the Morrow River that runs right down the middle of me I got um, rural water on one side but to trench it under the river it's going to be so we're going to look at developing that part of it to even enhance my practices with water development um, a lot of guys are going to use that to maintain the herd that they have through this drought um, I think that's a recipe for disaster depending on if they're still conventional ranching if they are doing some sort of intensive rotation it probably could work but that's the thing is, is they just need to, to do some inventory on their, on their grasses to see. Um, and that's, that's the big thing is, is water. Water is one of the most important things, I think, in either a drought situation or anything to, to get you to enhance your regenerative practices. So it's a tool to better manage. Right? It is. Yeah, it is. Not, you're not stuck to the water's good in this dam right now. I better be there. Yes, yes. So yeah, and and it's going to allow you to to be more flexible with with your paddocks and 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 able to do things like I said. If something comes up, I need to be in this pasture a little longer, and I and I can move my water tanks. It it it's just going to be such a benefit. So you've talked some about moving water and and these smaller paddocks. So there's there's clearly a temporary component. Of infrastructure on, on the place talk a little bit about that what's that look like for you well it's overground pipe um, so that's what I done I went to Pat Guptel's uh, in 2016 or 17 and he showed me how you can can move your paddocks by dragging around overground uh, pipe and be a lot more flexible so um, that's the ranch's goal from here on out is to have you know, not so much underground, you know, we'll have a lot more overground and being able to be a lot more flexible and just have a central point where we're going to be dragging off of in a, in a hydrant or whatever it needs to be to, to do that. So, um, when I done a, a, my last deal with the NRCS and put some pipeline in, I purposely put hydrants all along for that purpose, knowing I can, I can have hit this area that I normally never hit because it's too far away from my water 
now I can go in that area and hit it, hit it like I want to. So, so that's one of the biggest things is, is the overground pipe is going to be a big benefit. Gives you even more flexibility. Yes. In places that, well, you served this, this larger pasture with water already, but it still didn't get you all the way there. So, yeah. so that's a, definitely a tool. Yes. But it requires your time and management. It does. It does require my time and management. Um, I think that's one thing is when you do these regenerative practice, people are going to understand is it, it's some of it's a little more labor intensive and time intensive, but the benefits you get out of it are just immense. You know, they might not be there in a few years. They might not be as labor intensive as or as time intensive once you really master it. You know? So you talk about taking surface water out of a pond, a dugout, or a dam, and, and putting it into a tank. What value does that provide you? Well, it, the first value is that I'm not having uh, my animals drinking in a dam that they're pissing and you know what around, but it gives me the flexibility to move my cattle into these smaller paddocks and not have everything in not so much, I don't try to do a wagon wheel, but a wagon wheel around around the, the dams to where that's the central point. This allows me to pump it and move my tanks to different locations where my, where my pastures are. And that way, those are the points. So I can put my tank in an area that's probably a hard pen that needs a lot of hoof impact. And then that will give me some benefit by having that hoof impact in that area and then moving and then giving that a lot of time to rest. But you know, uh, my, my stock dams are, they got some water in it, but they're not great. So then I don't want a chance to lose anything by bogging down any of that. Um, and allowing me to have these tanks out, I, I got a, a chicken feeder style tank that I got, gives my calves a chance to water also out of that. And so that I'm not, the benefit there that the calves and the cows are getting fairly good water you know um, it's not the greatest because still out of stock them in a drought but they're not urinating and everything in it so so what minimum amount of surface protection or, or grass residue litter whatever you want to call it do you try to aim for after grazing after grazing before I went to the grasslands coalition everything was visual um, everything I had learned up to that point was kind of visual you know, you, you need litter um, in order for your for your grasses to recover and to to help it to, you know, to get your goals you want. After I went to the uh, grazing school, uh, I started doing uh, pounds per acre. And that has kind of really changed around, as you guys seen in my pasture walk last year, of some of the the quick turnaround things I had in my in my pastures with just leaving enough residue. Uh, before I done all this, I, I, I didn't have enough herd. I was, I was uh, you know, uh, custom grazing. And I was just trying to get as many animals in there and, and I wasn't really leaving any residue. With my own herd I was, I was just trying to make money. With, and then after I finally wisened up and realized, you know, that grass is, is my money maker, you know, that I need to do the best I can. So uh, right now I'm just trying to strive for I don't have a, a tonnage. I try to leave, I, I didn't know, but I try to leave 1,200 pounds of a of, uh, ton left after I grazed it. This year, I'm probably going to increase that because it's so dry. I don't, I'm, I'm probably going to try to leave 1,500 even. I don't even know what, you know, at least 1,500 pounds or tons per acre on the ground this year to just try to help my when we do get rain so that I can recover a lot faster so um, in the past it was visual just seeing the litter was good enough now doing the clippings and everything else um, and the other thing I've incorporated is is I do a custom blend mineral and I and I do a lot of clippings and send it in and it kind of tells me what my lacking in nutrition and minerals and that's really helped. So um, I noticed where I started implementing a lot of my grazing, the, the mineral nutrition has 
the deficiency has gone down with the better management that I have done. You know, so um, so those are some of the things that I do. Healthy ring equals healthy livestock and wildlife. Yes. Yes. So do you have a target for a minimum amount of rest before you would graze a pasture? I do. I, I typically try, because we're, our rainfall is so minimal here, I think we get 17 inches. I try to target 355 to 60 days of, of recovery in a normal year. Now in this drought plan, I don't think I've ever hit a drought this severe. I mean, in, me personally. So that's probably going to move more days into this. Now I don't know exactly how yet till I start, once the grass comes and I can go do my, my tonnages and, and know. But as of today, about 355 to 360 days, I want rest on, on whatever I, whatever I just grazed and to give it that recovery time. Now, if I wasn't in the bureau system, it, it might change because I'm kind of limited on a lot of things. Um, if I wasn't a bureau system, it would probably, wouldn't be probably as long, but it, maybe it still will be, but I, I, I would probably have more animals impacting the ground that I currently have but I would probably keep the rest days or the recovery days the same, so. So we've talked about A, B, and C herds, Dugan, um, but how do you know when to make decisions? Well, through my drought plan that I created, um, I have trigger dates on it, you know, uh, it, and it goes back to, I have a May trigger date that I, if I don't, uh, if I don't get so such amount of rain on this day that it triggers these activities that I have planned in there. If I'm custom grazing, letting a, the custom grazer know you can, you're going to have to only bring 75% of your herd. I, I am going to cut you back by 25. If it's my herd, I really got to start. Then it triggers. Maybe I need to look at these classes of animals that I'm going to get rid of. April's got, I think I got two trigger dates in April. If I don't get certain amount of rain in these days, then this happens. A, B, and C herd. Uh, C herd's gonna go, or if I'm custom grazing, 50% of it's gonna can't come. And then I think in the second trigger date is if I'm custom grazing, you you can't come at all. Or if it's me, then for sure I am selling have C herd and possibly looking at other options. And last year, like I said, is the first year I actually had to implement my drought plan. Um, this year, I have implemented way earlier because I knew I wasn't gonna meet them trigger dates. So my herd is way down. I don't think I can get rid of any more animals without meeting my obligations. So I'm there. So now these trigger dates, I'm probably gonna have to go back and look at it and say, all right, what else am I gonna have to do? So I think my drought plan is gonna have to be amended this year because and I probably should do that is, is now I know I'm, I'm down as far as I can go with my class of animals and still meet my obligations. What else do I need to do? Okay. So my drought plan has so many days. Well, man, I can't, I can't do, maybe my grazing has got to change or, or something else has got to change. Um, so that's something that I got to look at because I'm kind of already, I've already destocked because of the drought to a point where I know I, these are the animals I can meet my obligations with. Now, now what else do I got to do? So that's something that's going to be evolving with me. And this, this year is probably the year to do it now that I've, I've kind of followed my drought plan and I'm destocked to where I can't probably destock anymore without risk, you know, visiting with the banker. Um, so now it's probably going to evolve. What, what, what next? So. A lot of folks might consider that residue or litter as wasted grass. What benefits do you see in terms of building resilience in your soil to, to bounce back when drought breaks? Well, I, I, I think it's a, now I really think it's a big, big benefactor just learning what I've learned in the last few years is it, it's going to help recover and, and maintain and not get any worse. So when we do get rain, it's going to just bounce back that much faster. You know, Steve Kenyon in Canada, and I love his quote, he, he doesn't manage for, for any resource but water. 
and leaving that litter on the ground is um, that's what he says he, he manages to to retain water so that is one big benefit if you leave that wasted grass that people say or any of that it's going to allow your your water retention to to be that much better when we do get rain and so that it can recover um, a lot faster it has it has the the bugs in it and all the other the things it needs to recover and it's not having to start from a bare ground and and take so much longer to to get where it needs to get Dugan, we all know people that, that were out of grass last summer. It's pretty dry so far this spring, except in the far northwest that just got snow. Um, folks are looking in the mirror and seeing, what am I going to do? They're, they're, they're backed into a corner, out of options and out of grass. What first steps should they take or what advice do you have for them? I think the first step they need to do is they need to run their numbers on their, on their ranch understanding what their obligations are what what they what they need to meet and then going back and looking at if they're if they're a cow calf operation doing a, a, a inventory on our cattle running a abc or even a, however however deep you want to go and seeing what's liquidable to manage through this and a lot of guys have a hard time doing that but once you run your numbers and you're more comfortable with it and you can see that the benefits of having these classes of animals and getting rid of them isn't going to be the end of me because i i know where i'm at with my numbers so i think the biggest thing they need to do is is know where they're at with their with the numbers and when i mean their numbers their their economic financial even their livestock numbers uh their grass inventory there's a lot into this, but if you're going to make a big change, which guys really need to do in the drought in order to survive, you need to run those numbers and know where you're at in order to make a change that you're comfortable with. You know, because most guys will say, well, in the years past, I've done in this and this and this, and they're going to try to feed their way through a drought again, or they're going to try to do something and make it. But knowing their numbers and being comfortable with them might say, you know, if I sell class C herd, we'll be okay. And here's what we can do with the pro proceeds from that, make us through, get our cash flow doing it, or saving it and, and getting into a different herd, getting into a different class of animal that's that's easily liquidable too. You know, so so don't be so rigid on I'm a cow calf guy and I gotta have four hundred head of cows in order to make it. Do I really need to have four hundred cows to make it, or can, if my grass is telling me I can only run two hundred and eighty this year, what do I got to do to get that two hundred and eighty, and still survive? Well, we might not, we might not be able to go on this vacation or that vacation, or we might not be able to do this. Um, but knowing your numbers and knowing what your obligations are and being comfortable being able to meet those is one thing they need to do. So folks watching these videos with you, Dugan, probably noticed this flip chart on the door. I wondered if you might tell us a little bit about what, what's on here. Uh, yeah, the, this is a uh, action items that through my uh, Rancher for Profit executive link, uh, every time we have a board meeting, you're left, you, you leave there with action items that you got to do. And the board helps you come up with some of these. So, um, some of the things that we come up with, I, I just went through some personal deals and, and big changes in the ranch. So um, one of the big things my board thought was, is I need to develop my own mission and vision for, for myself, um, you know, because the ranch already has a mission and vision, but what's Dugan's mission and vision also within that ranch um, through the big changes that's come, come through the ranch and personally. Uh, the next was is, uh, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, I went through uh, some some depression through some ranch deals. Uh, I had a, and so developing a physical and mental health regimen. Uh, you know, talked to one of my best friends about being an accountability partner. You know, I, I've done that. I've done. I've developed that, and um, set my 
20, uh, 22 regenerative health goals. So every, every year I do this, but you know, they, they see that my regenerative health goals are, are very important to my ranch. And, and, um, I didn't have, uh, my new goal set for this year. I have my, my grazing plan and, and everything else, but you know, um, they said, what else goals do you want to hit? You know, so the, the, I'm developing them and then they give a date when you want to do it and who's supposed to do it. So, um, that, that's what this is. It's, it's just an action item that, that the ranch has to go home with and get completed before the next meeting. And the next meeting is July 8th through the 20th. And then we have conference calls in between there just to check up with each other. So that, that's what this is. So a, a very strategic personal and business relationships are, are helping you keep moving forward yeah. and not be bogged down by the day to day. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing through executive link is, is they help you see what the, the ranch are, are, are the rancher needs to do in order to, to be successful. So, and that's what these are. And these over here are importance and urgency, and that's, that's a ranching for profit kind of deal. So, um, so those, those are some of the things that, that I, mine, uh, my board came up with that I need to do before the meeting of July 18th and 20th. And then after every meeting, we have a new one that, you got to put up somewhere where you can see it. Don't don't bring it home and put it in the, in the file. You got to put it up so you see it every day and make sure you're hitting it. Yep. Yep. Written goals or objectives or milestones make the difference. Yep. 